Welcome everyone to episode five of the Brandon Adams podcast. I have with me Greg Zuckerman. Fresh off the presses is his new book, The Man Who Solved the Market, How Jim Simons Launched the Quant Revolution. So Greg, I, I haven't seen any sales figures, but I, I get the feeling that this is, uh, this is quite the popular book. Uh, all of my friends have read it in the past week or so. Uh, so far, so good. We are uh, on the New York Times bestseller list and um... The Wall Street Journal as well, my, my paper's uh, list. So, so far, so good. People seem to be interested in the topic, and uh, hopefully they enjoy the book as well. So I was, th I was thinking as I was reading this book, uh, your, your next book has to be about a blinding failure. Uh, <laughs> because, because this book is about maybe the most success successful hedge fund of all times, 60 plus percent compounded returns uh and your previous book the greatest trade ever i'm sorry uh the frackers came out in 2013 the greatest trade ever came out in 2009 was about john paulson who had uh what might have been the greatest trade ever uh, certainly when with risk taken into account he made billions of dollars when uh mortgage bonds collapsed so yeah, I think your next book might have to be about the blinding, the, the blinding failure. I'm open to it. Whatever, you know, people are interested in. And I look for narratives. I look for stories I'm big on. Um, I, I like finding some revolution, some phenomenon that hasn't been explained uh, properly, why something has happened and tell the story behind the story. So uh, yeah, I'm always looking for some drama. So I was in academics for a long time. Uh, I taught economics at Harvard for nine years and uh, spent a lot of time in math and economics courses. And I certainly, I certainly met some quirky characters, but it strikes me that, uh, that Jim Simons is, is one of the quirkiest characters that you would encounter in academics, much less finance. Um, I didn't know that world so well before I started my research and I was a little concerned that they'd be boring mathematicians. It's not just Simon's, it's a book about all kinds of different characters. And yeah, I, I was relieved when I started encountering just quirky, headstrong, odd, unusual, very colorful uh, individuals who worked with Simon's and Simon's himself, just one of the more fascinating characters that I've come across in my 23 years at the Wall Street Journal. So uh, I, was, I was relieved <laughs> to have find uh, these individuals as colorful as they were. Now, he seems to have a little bit of the adrenaline drive. He, uh, after college, spent some time touring around South America on a shoestring budget. His parents were very concerned about him. Uh, he smokes two packs of cigarettes a day, at least, at least, um, maybe likes poker judging from his, uh, math for America fundraising. Sure. Uh, so he, he likes adrenaline. Maybe he likes, is it fair to say that he likes the gamble associated with his market activities? He likes the adrenaline rush. He is a man of adventure. So yeah, early on, as you suggest, he did this a motorcycle or a scooter, motor scooter um, ride uh, adventure from uh, Boston to Buenos Aires. That was the goal. They didn't get quite that far, but they went all the way down. And yeah, adventure after adventure, escapade, um, even mischief he got into. At one point, he and his friends were in some town, little town in Mexico, and they had interrupted uh, inadvertently the siesta of the local townsmen, and they were upset, and they came after them, cornered them with machetes, put them to, the, to, the, to Simon's neck. Um, and there were other adventures. Even earlier, after he graduated high school, uh, he and his friends drove around the country, United States, and saw some of the uh, abject poverty of, of many and just the 
terrible circumstances some people are living in and really had an impact on him his whole life. But as you suggest, he's, um, he's somebody who's an academic, he's a quant, but he also has his feet firmly in the real world too. And he likes the, the rush of trading uh, and other adventures. And it makes him unique in that world. Not everyone who's an academic also uh, gets something from, from trading and, and that uh, adrenaline rush. So he's, he's a fascinating guy and, and very unique individual in, in a lot of ways. So one thing I thought was uh, quite surprising about your book is that you do delve into his trading strategies. Obviously, there's no great detail, but the reader comes away with a sense of uh, what it was like day to day at Renaissance. Uh, one thing that was fascinating for me is that I, I taught behavioral finance for five years at a time when the quant hedge funds were in their ascendancy and i recall uh chatting with quantitative managers at the time who were trying to pick up some of the insights of behavioral finance research and and applying them at their quant hedge funds and it seems to me that they were applying only a small sliver of the stuff that Jim Simons was applying at the same time. So in other words, I would chat with, with um, hedge fund managers that maybe would read an article from behavioral finance and note some anomaly and they would spend a lot of time testing that anomaly and seeing if it generated excess returns. It seems like judging from your book, that at the same time, Simons would take that anomaly and slice it a thousand different ways and test every variant over every time period and every, every covariant that it might have existed with it and just look for any sort of 5149 type edge. Uh, it, it feels like he was way ahead of his competition in terms of just the the number of variables that he considered and the ways that he would put them together to test. I think that's true. Uh, he is a scientist, and as a scientist, he looks for structure um, when others see chaos. And part of what they did was, as you suggest, they tested academic papers, and they actually spent a lot of time doing that and didn't see that much value in them. They also have to think about, they don't, they didn't focus so much on the whys as much as other people. Um, they look for patterns and they will test everything. And the talent they he's accumulated, he surrounded himself with at Renaissance is extraordinary. People talk about, oh, PhDs working on the street. Everyone's got PhDs working at their firms today, but, um, and they do, <laughs> but it, you can't really compare with what Renaissance has. They have individuals that ran uh, departments um, in various prestigious universities around the world, uh, like a David Donahue, other people who was, was at Stanford, I'm thinking, people that ran with senior people um, doing remarkable work in um, astronomy, physics, other various areas of mathematics. And... Um, as a result, they, uh, they have better talent and they test everything. It's all testing. That's what they do. And any new ideas, they, they test everything. Is just, you, you have a thesis, you have a hypothesis. They spend the whole day um, throwing, uh, th th throwing science at it, th testing data, acquiring new data. There's no data like more data is kind of their phrase internally. I think they borrowed that from IBM where Bob Mercer and Peter Brown came from. So people talk about quant and they make these broad statements about quant. And frankly, I did before I started this work as well. And we journalists do. And, but you can't really um, broadly talk about quant really, just like you can't really broadly talk about even active investing or fundamental investing. They're different types. And you've got quant that includes high frequency. You've got medium frequency, which is what, Jim Simons and his colleagues do. You've got like AQR and the factor kind of investing. So yeah, what they do is pretty unique and they do it in a much more sophisticated way uh, than, than most everybody else. Now, 
You mentioned that they're doing medium term investing. They're not doing high frequency trading. Um, what they do seem to be good at is playing defense against high frequency trading. So uh, at one point, you quote Jim Simons as saying, we understand the cost of a trade better than anyone, the cost of getting in and out of a trade, the friction. Uh, so they clearly know when maybe they have the worst of it against high frequency trading opposition and how to minimize the cost of trading. One thing you mentioned they do is slice the orders into very small sizes of, I take it maybe a hundred or even less. Um, and they, uh, Jim Simon seems to talk about this idea of the friction quite a bit and the need for uh, not only having a great idea, but having a great idea that remains a great idea after getting in and out and moving prices and all that. Yeah. So when I started the project, I figured I'd be looking for signals, great signals. I don't know, four or three o'clock every Tuesday, you know, this commodity price moves this way or this stock does. And yeah, they've got great signals, uh, um, trades, approaches, etc. But as you suggest, it's just as much the risk management and their um, strategies in terms of trading. And they were really early in terms of things like slippage, how much will your trading impact prices? Obviously you can have a great trade, but if you move the market before you can put on the trade, then you've lost uh, a lot of your profits and vice versa when you with sell. So they were early in analyzing that and they're really, they're great at knowing their risk, but also knowing how much they impact the market and in knowing how to spread your trades out, how to layer into it. As you suggest, they look to people on the outside. People consider them high frequency sometimes because they do, they do trade rapid, rapid fire, but it's not to step in front of our trades like a high frequency firm. Um, they don't co-locate, things like that. They basically will, will trade rapidly to put on a position so as not to impact prices. And they hold on average, on average for about two days, sometimes less, sometimes more, moments to uh, months is what they people internally call it. But um, yeah, that's part of their genius that they trade better. They don't just find opportunities, they know how to trade better than most. Um, and not everyone is, has always been as focused on, on that aspect of the risk management and on the, the trading and the impact. But we're talking in the early 90s, Henry Laufer, uh, became a billionaire in his own right, lives down in Florida, interesting guy. He was the king at, at pushing them and developing the system so that um, they could trade without having a, a, uh, too much of an impact on the market and on prices. So um, they have this, you, you have trading tactics, which are these maybe behavioral finance findings or other findings that they can translate into small edges. And then you have strategy, which is what is the overall portfolio construction at a point in time? How do you make trade-offs between expected value and risk and so forth? And before Renaissance fully hit its stride, you tell the story of how uh, they knew they had a lot of edge and they knew individual trades that looked good, but they really struggled in their minds uh, in terms of how to build the dream machine, how to build the, the perfect machine, not to say black box, but something like a black box that, that made, that say rank ordered all the trades and risk reward and put them together into a, a portfolio construction. Um, and so the reader is thinking, well, things are going fantastic for this fund. They have, they have true edge, they're making amazing returns, they're getting more and more funds under management. Um, but you're telling the story of how that's not enough for them. They want, they want to be able to have the dream machine, that something that's making in real time risk reward calculations and putting together a, an actual portfolio. Yeah, it was that in the fact that they figured out commodities, bond futures, currencies, but they couldn't figure out equities. And so there were a few things they, they you know, there, this is the greatest money-making machine Wall Street has ever seen, but it took them a while to get there. There were a lot of obstacles along the way, more than I would have expected. 
And like, as you suggest, until around 1994, they had figured out everything but equities. They couldn't figure out equities. And part of it was they were putting all these inputs into a system. They had improved on an existing system that Morgan Stanley first worked on, and then this guy, Robert Fry, um, who was hired by Jim Simons at Renaissance, and then a group at Renaissance, um, including Bob Mercer and Peter Brown, who came over from IBM. And it had all kinds of inputs. It was an engineering task and challenge as much as anything else. Um, what they do at Renaissance is they hold, uh, hold around 4,000, 5,000 stocks long, around four, 5,000 short. And there are all kinds of parameters and in, 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 in well, um, when do you put on trades, when don't you? And yeah, there are all kinds of glitches and, and issues early on, just kind of basic programming that um, they messed up on. Even, even these, you know, Bob Mercer is a, is a programmer, a scientist from, from IBM. And there was this number, this S&P 500 number uh, that was static and it should have been updating. And it took a more junior uh, employee, this guy, David Magerman, to, to find the glitch. But um, yeah, people internally marvel at just the engineering uh, of their, their model. And there are other firms have different models. That's the beauty of, of Renaissance. One of their advantages is they have just a single model and it includes so many inputs and uh, criteria. Um, and to put it all together to a, into a trading system is, is really a technological feat. Now you mentioned Bob Mercer and that gets to another important part of the story, which uh, is that <clears throat> Simons was a sneaky good manager. So he, he has what is, what is like an academic department of borderline, not insane, but quirky individuals whose quirkiness is growing as they uh, have more and more success within Renaissance. And he's able to manage this group with, with some hiccups, but basically successfully over a very long period of time. Yeah, I remember speaking to someone who worked at the firm and he made the argument that Jim Simon's genius is in managing genius. And, you know, Simon's himself, this was a surprise for me as I wrote the book, for Simon's himself didn't come up with algorithms, signals, real advances, which was somewhat disappointing for me. Um, but what he did was manage the geniuses who did and inspire them and give them incentives and get them all on the same page and hire them. And if you think about it, the people that he hires, they're not Wall Street types. They're often not people who want to get wealthy. Um, they look down on hedge funds until they get there. They look down on hedge funds and what they're doing. These are academics, generally speaking, scientists, mathematicians. So it is a real challenge for Simons to hire them. And he relied on some skills he had honed earlier in his career. So he came from uh, SUNY Stony Brook where he ran the math department. He, he really built that. And there he, he, he developed this ability to find the best talent around the country and somehow get him to leave prestigious jobs. I'm thinking of Jim Axe, who was the youngest uh, tenured uh, professor at Cornell and Simon somehow gets him to leave to go to Stony Brook when no one wants to work in Stony Brook. So, he had those skills when he, when he started his firm and he subsequently did the same thing at Renaissance, Jim Simons, where he found talent and convinced them to co come join his trading firm. And he did it by basically presenting them with intellectual challenges. Uh, yes, you don't care about trading and even getting wealthy, but come over for a day, spend a day helping me tackle a problem. And then once he, they got there, they saw the challenge that is trading and, they were intrigued. And then once they start making money, it's hard not to keep going. Uh, once you, you're wealthy, you want to get even wealthier. So, but, so he was great at hiring people, great at motivating them, getting them on the same page. He also developed this internal um, system. I mean, if you think about it, they're, on the outside, they're as secretive as anybody else. There's no transparency. But on the inside, they're remarkably unique in, in that it's very transparent. People know, everyone knows what everyone, everyone else is working on. There's one system, there's one code. Anybody can see the code, even junior people, and work on it and improve it, which is rare. Even at like the big tech companies, I'm told, Google and such, there, there are corners of the code that no one can see. Maybe the founders can see. 
That's not the case, my understanding, at, at Renaissance from people there, people who used to work there. And you're taking a real risk if you're Jim Simons with that approach, because if even a junior person can see the entire code, it's IP that you can walk out the door with. But it hasn't really been a problem because A, they make so much money that no one's leaving. And B, if they leave, they probably retire or they start a foundation or go back to academia. And it helps that he hires only from academia. He doesn't hire from Wall Street. So if you've never worked on Wall Street, you're less apt to leave Renaissance and go work for a Wall Street firm. Maybe you work for a tech company, maybe. So I don't know if it was a conscious decision, frankly, on his part. Jim Simon's kind of lucked into this amazing model where he hires the best talent in science and mathematics, and they're not from Wall Street, so they're not going to leave and go work for Wall Street. So again, he's, he's a, it's a book about trading to some extent and investing, but it's just as much of a book about um, management, a management book and, and about technology too. So he didn't have the problem um, until very late in the day of people directly stealing his code. Um, but he did have the problem of people imitating success. So people hearing about and observing the Renaissance success and trying to copy it uh, in firms. So there was uh, a real rise in quant hedge funds that was partially inspired by, by Renaissance. And there is a, an interesting portion in the book where in August 2007, they're suffering from the fact that there are so many funds treading in similar water. Although it did seem like maybe they took less damage than many of the other funds, maybe some of the, the copycat funds, is that fair to say? Yes, although for a few days it was just awful and chaotic and harrowing. And um, when you build a system that it's in many ways machine learning where uh, it trades on its own to some extent, you don't know why it's doing what it's doing. So it's one thing for a guy like me, whatever, a fundamental type trader, I'm not a trader, but right, where I do it more in a fundamental um, strategy, it's one thing for somebody like myself to um, – to have losses, you, you know why you're suffering. You're not happy about them. But let's say hypothetically, you know, you're long Apple. Okay, Apple's down, tech's down. Okay, I understand it. But picture yourself working at Renaissance and things are melting down in the summer of 2007 and you don't know why you're suffering serious, heavy losses. And in, in just days, you've, you've lost tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars and you don't know why. So it's even scarier. And yeah, they do things differently than most everyone else. Their time frame, their approach. There are some people that are somewhat similar to Sigmund does a little bit similarly sometimes. Um, uh, a few other people I'm thinking of, but they're, they're unique in a lot of ways. And yet, as you suggest, in 2007, in the summer, they suffered like every quant fund. It was, their strategies were more similar than even they had realized. So, um, you know, even, even they suffer scary, scary periods, yeah. Um, did you find much relationship between the market environment and their performance? The, their, their sharp ratio over time suggests that they can uh, deal with any type of environment and they're, they're relatively <laughs> unscathed by the poor periods. But uh, your book notes that some of the turbulent return periods did come with market downdrafts. So like March 2000 was challenging, but then 2001 was a great year for them. So it seems like maybe when an initial market hiccup occurs, it's bad for them, but then they're able to quickly adjust to the new environment. Is that a fair generalization? I mean, yes. 2000 was an amazing year. They were up 100% that year, but early on in March, when things got rough for the NASDAQ, things got rough. Uh, for Renaissance and medallion funds in particular, it didn't take them long to figure out and to turn things around. But yes, I, I don't know if I generalize that. They do best actually in, in times of crisis and in panic. When everyone else is panicking, they do especially well. Turns in the market, they do well. But right, in March of 2000 was a, was a really rough period. Um, and I think they do, they, but they generally often take advantage of, of people's behavioral mistakes partly because they've mapped them out. They know uh, better than most. They, their data goes back hundreds of years. So 
they have a historic perspective on um, how we, we all behave uh, in times of crisis and often they take advantage. Uh, it's not to say that they always will. I mean, we can talk about it later, but you know, the market is changing to some extent. That's my one kind of question for the future about with these, uh, with these individuals at Renaissance, can they keep it going while the market, they, they, their whole thesis is that market behavior will repeat. It's about, I mean, they're not so dissimilar from technical traders. It's about patterns, pricing patterns in the market and looking at past performance and assuming that's going to persist to some extent. And it has, but as more passive investors, uh, as we become more passive, uh, investors um, shift to ETFs and index funds, et cetera, uh, there are fewer individuals to take advantage of, in, fewer active uh, institutions as well. So one wonders, but at least so far, they've, they're doing well this year too. So they've been able to adjust and it's all based on the behavior of investors and the thesis that it's going to repeat to some extent. And yeah, there have been some moments of crisis when they've had some difficulty, but they've adjusted quickly or their models have adjusted quickly. Well, if they've managed so many regime changes, one can be relatively confident that they can, they can manage others. Uh, so to shift gears a little bit, I wanted to uh, satisfy a personal curiosity, which is how, how you get all of this work done. You've got at least three hats as far as I see, or four hats including parent, but the uh, nonfiction book writing, which is a full-time job in itself, uh, award-winning, many-time award-winning Wall Street Journal reporter, and uh, writing books with your sons uh, for, for a younger audience. So take me through how you, are you a workaholic? How do you structure the day? What is, what is, the, what is the routine? It's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure I'd call myself a workaholic, but I, I uh, am very focused. I don't watch that much television. I'll watch sports with my sons. Uh, I watch The Office and Seinfeld once in a while, but I don't think I've seen any of those Netflix shows. Um, I saw Fleabag, that was Amazon, but I don't really watch that much television. I love my work. And when you get caught up in a project, you're learning all the time. So especially, I, I take on these projects that I shouldn't take on because I know nothing. I don't say I know nothing. I know too, way too little about them. So I did a book about the energy revolution a few years ago, how we found all this oil and gas from fracking and horizontal drilling in this country when all the experts say we couldn't. Um, and I, I'm not an energy person. Uh, I live, I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. I live in New Jersey. I had never been to Oklahoma, but uh, I just thought it'd be a good story there. And I also thought I'd learn. And same thing with this. I'm not a math person. I think I took pre-calc, that was as high as I got. And with this book, um, I have to understand, I had to understand to learn some serious, sometimes complicated math um, um, subjects because I write about Jim Simon's early breakthroughs and his early work, and uh, I had to learn about hidden Markov models and stochastic differential equations and um, all kinds of other concepts. And so, but when I'm learning, I'm enjoying, and I throw myself into these projects and I juggle, you know, during the day I'm at the journal and I'm writing stories and I'm breaking news and I'm doing, I, I'm on an investigative team right now. So I dig into things. But sometimes there's overlap with my work and my projects on the side. So, you know, when I write about Jim Simons and quant traders, I can sometimes write uh, stories uh, about them for the journal. Um, so uh, I will get caught up in a project and I'll basically work during the day and then at night, come home, see the family, go down to my basement. And I often will work from like 10, 11 p.m., on. I'm a late night person. I put on music. I go to my basement. And there are a few times, especially during this project, when um, I'm working late at night and I hear noise upstairs and I'm like, oh, my kids left the TV on again. That's awful. So I go to turn off the TV and there's no TV on. And I'm like, what? What, what was that sound? And I realized it's the birds getting up in the morning. And I just worked through the night and I didn't realize it. Uh, so I get caught up 
in the chase. And sometimes, you know, with this one, Jim Simons didn't want to talk to me for a long time. He told people not to talk to me. Some of the, the quants on the street, uh, his, even his competitors wouldn't talk to me. His ex-employees wouldn't talk to me. And it was scary, <laughs> but also kind of created a challenge. I like a challenge. And I wanted to see if I could be the one to tell the story about Simons and how he did it. So inadvertently, they kind of added allure to the chase, I think, Simons and his colleagues. And finally, he did agree to talk to me. We spent over 10 hours together, and he was quite helpful. Um, he didn't tell me secrets, uh, but he told me a lot. So uh, about his life and mathematics, interesting things he's doing lately. So to answer your question, I will, during the day, focus on the journal. And then I get, I'll spend a little time with the family and uh, work into the night. And there, there are actually more hours in the day than most people realize. Um, so, you know, let's say hypothetically you go to bed at one and you wake up at seven, seven thirty. It's not bad. And I'll catch up on some sleep, you know, the weekend sometimes. So then I'll work most of the day Sunday and Saturdays. Uh, I'm, I'm Orthodox Jewish. So I, don't, I don't work Saturdays and I recharge and I sleep. And then I work Saturday nights and Sundays. So, yeah, it's not for everyone. Trust me, it's not for everyone. And well, sometimes I'll figure out per hour how much I'm making, uh, like on my books and stuff. And it's a depressing. You don't even want to go do that exercise because um, it ain't worth it if you're doing it for the money. So, it's more the challenge and, and the pleasure of um, learning and, and uncovering something that maybe hadn't, uh, people hadn't been able to understand and didn't know much about before. So you sit down at 11 p.m., put on, put on the music. It's after a full work day. And yeah. you uh, just make a cup of coffee and- A cup and of green tea. Uh, and you can get at least two, three hours when I was younger, so the Frackers was even crazier. I, I, that one I did even faster, that book, for whatever reason. Then I was doing most nights till like three-ish. And you sleep till eight, maybe. And you can get to work at a normal hour and get five hours. And it's not so bad. But this one, I'm a little bit older. And I really, most nights went to bed around two. So, you know, you can work from 10, 11 to two. It's not 10 to two. You got four hours there. So it's, it's reasonable to say time isn't a constraint, is your argument. It's focus, and that is the strength of yours, it sounds like. Yeah, but it's not for everyone. And also, I enjoy this. So if I didn't enjoy it, so like people ask about writing books, and I tell them, make sure, make sure you're really into the topic because there are those 2 a.m.s in your basement when everyone's asleep upstairs, and it's just you and the topic, you and the subject matter. you got to really be passionate about it because it's two two years of obsess obsession and challenges you're gonna face and right so i i, I so it's, it's constraint is time isn't a constraint there are a lot there's many more hours than people realize in the day but also find something you're you're passionate about and it's not it's a chore clearly but it's not a burden you're you're learning all the time you're dealing with i mean i had the privilege of meeting with some of the greatest mathematicians of, in the country, scientists, we got to talk about all kinds of things, you know, life and um, evolution and beginning origins of man. And um, I, I'm, these are some of the smartest people in, in the country. So uh, for me to be able to go out to Princeton, I'm thinking of uh, like an eight year old professor that once worked with Jim Simons and buy him lunch and spend time with him. How lucky am I? So I don't normally get a chance to talk to this fascinating people that accomplish a lot are a hundred times smarter than I'll ever be. So uh, that's how I do it. Do you have any uh, tricks of the trade? Are there any favorite software that you use? Do you use Evernote or are you old school note cards, notebooks, Scrivener? I, I am. My handwriting's awful. No, I will. Dropbox. Um, I use Dropbox so I can access it everywhere. I will type I, I don't take I don't tape my interviews because I find that it makes people uncomfortable unless people want to unless I have reason to think that maybe I should get it on tape. I remember Jim Simons asked me not to put it on tape and that was fine. Uh, so some people just don't like that, and, and I will type sometimes along while I interview, which doesn't work for a lot of people. It doesn't work 
all the time for me, but you could do it in, a, in an appropriate way where it doesn't inter, in, inter, interfere. I mean, I, I frankly, in terms of my technique, I'm a curious person. I went into this job, this industry, because I like to ask questions and it gets on the nerves of family members at times. Um, my wife, especially sometimes we have a great marriage, but you know, it could be annoying to be married to a reporter. I ask questions all the time and I do it because I'm genuinely curious about people. I mean, everyone's got a great story. I'm sure you've got a fascinating life story. I really think everyone does. You drop me down in a barbecue and put me down next to some, you know, dentist, whatever. I bet you he or she has a really interesting story of their own. How, what channel, I, I think everyone, and it goes back to my, the book writing I do with my two sons. So we've written two books about sports stars and how they overcame challenges in their life. And um, my youngest son, who's 17 right now, was born with a, a hand difference. He's got uh, two fingers on his left hand. And we started these projects. I, I started these projects to give him a little more confidence. So if we would go and talk to, I figured if we went and talked to some sports stars and how they dealt with their own physical differences, um, Jim Abbott was born with one arm, um, sports stars who were abused sexually, uh, physically, when they were younger, dealt with racism, all kinds of different challenges. I thought that he'd become a little more comfortable with his difference. It worked to some extent, um, and he just enjoyed the project, and my eldest did too. But again, these were, I like the theme of overcoming obstacles. How do people overcome obstacles? And it's a lot of my business writing as well. I mean, Jim Simons built this great empire. He's worth $23 billion, the greatest trader, moneymaker Wall Street's ever seen. But it's a story about how he overcame obstacles and challenges. And that's true. That's the through line, I think, for a lot of my writing, both for adults and for, for children. I think we as readers, I know I do, selfishly, I, I, learn, I learn from people and how they overcame uh, obstacles. Because we all have remarkable uh, obstacles that we, and imposing obstacles in, in life, whoever you are. And I like to learn how, how people dealt with them. So that's a lot of my writing. And I, I'm not even sure how I got this, to this, this part uh, with, with my answer, but uh, that's- uh, Do your sons have the writing gene? Do they have the, the focus? No, I'm not sure they're gonna go into it as a profession. It's a very difficult profession. I've been lucky. I'm blessed. At, at the Wall Street Journal, I've got great colleagues and great editors. And in the book writing world, I've had a lot of help. Um, and as you, you and your audience knows, it's just a difficult time in, in some ways for, to be a writer. I mean, the newspaper business, thanks to Donald Trump, uh, we've sold a lot more copies. We have more subscribers than ever. But the advertising side of things is really challenged. So, um, yeah, my sons uh, enjoy writing and enjoyed the research. I mean, we got to sit in Yankee Stadium um, before a game talking to R.A. Dickey, who was a pitcher for uh, Toronto at the time, about how he almost, um, uh, he, he, he was close to suicide um, in, earlier in his life a, a few times uh, due to abuse, physical and sexual abuse that he, uh, he had to endure. So, I mean, it wasn't fun hearing those stories, but to be in Yankee Stadium and to hear from someone so inspirational uh, was it was a, a a gift was a was a blessing. So uh, yeah, they come, they love coming with me and meeting some of these individuals too, and hopefully it rubs off on them. Part of, I do this selfishly to teach them lessons. They're gonna have their own setbacks and obstacles, and young people. And that's why we wrote the book to try to inspire and teach some lessons for for young people. You should visit my first podcast. It was with James Blake. He had scoliosis when he was young and had oh, and broke his and, and broke his back uh, in his in his twenties and of course got to the top five tennis player. Wow. He has he has quite an wow. inspiring yeah, story. So story. You should yeah. uh, listen to that. Now, um, financial journalism books appear to be a bit of an island within the publishing world where it's just anecdotal, but it seems like they do quite well. And the rest of the publishing industry is not to say dying, but maybe going the way of like golf in, in uh, things that are dying with iPhones and shortening attention spans. Um, hmm, that's an interesting observation. Uh, I, I'm not sure I share it. There are outliers that do well, and no pun intended, like the book Outliers. Um, but there's still many that you're not aware of. I've got colleagues who have written really good books that don't get noticed. Uh, let's say Trump tweeted something that day and their television interview was canceled. 
and um, it's hard to get attention. He saps a lot of the air out from the room, uh, not just Trump, but there's a lot going on today. So yes, it, we have a built-in audience and it's a wealthier audience, so they will pay for books if they like them. Um, but I don't take it for granted. I uh, hold my breath when I publish books or when I come out with books because you don't know. You work two years plus on these books, those 4 a.m.s in your basement, and you don't know if people are going to buy them or not. But you are right that there's this built-in audience that is interested in, in the topic. Um, but books in general have held up okay, actually. I don't know how. I count my, lesson, my, my blessings because, right, you go on like a train or something, no one's reading. It's all, everyone's on their phone. Maybe they're reading on their phone. I don't know. Most of the time it's Candy Crush. But you don't see it as much. And yet books have been kind of flat in terms of sales. So I, I've been lucky. And, and yeah, I'm, I've been thankful for that. So do you have the next book waiting in, in the wings? Or are, are you sort of cultivating ideas as you work in journalism? I have an idea just over the last few weeks, I kind of like, but my publisher's not as enthused about. Um, so it's a process. And so I don't have any great idea. I'll have to see if this one works or not. But I'm always looking if your audience has a good idea for me or somebody else does. Uh, so I'd like to do another one at some point, but I'm just sort of recovering from this one. I mean, frankly, this is the hardest thing I ever did in my life to get people to talk who never talked before to understand what they were saying, the math and, and other kinds of concepts, and then to write it in a way that hopefully the masses appreciate um, was really hard, it was really the, the hardest thing I ever did in my life. So in some ways, I'm still um, getting over that and, and trying to uh, recover from the process. Well, the result is a book that is, is truly original and uh, extremely impressive. I think it'll be... Uh, a key mark in financial journalism for a long time. Oh, that's very sweet of you and kind of you. Thank you for saying. Well, um, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know uh, I caught you on a, on a holiday, um, but I appreciate this so, so much. I sure. absolutely love the book and I love this time. Uh, I wish you all the luck. Oh, I really appreciate it. Thank you and uh, happy holidays to you and everybody. There. All right. Be good. Take care. Bye.